I'm going to talk about biblical church membership. What the Bible teach about church membership? It's a, it's a, it's a, this is something that I'm surprised there's confusion on, really. It's, it's, it's not that complicated. And what I believe, you know, very clearly the Bible teaches, I'm surprised how few people understand that. Most people don't care much about it. Um, Baptists care greatly about church membership. Um, it's, it's a big doctrine of them. Um, it's, it's not so much of me unless it's the biblical uh, teaching. Not that people are wrong on it. It isn't a, a fighting issue, but it's just, uh, I think it helps you to understand what the Bible teaches about it. And then we do things a certain way, and, and people ask me about church membership, and I always feel like I see them. I just need to teach them the whole thing so they understand it, and, uh, um, because I think the Bible is pretty clear on it, but I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it means. And uh, Matthew 18 and verse 15 Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him and his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if thou wilt not hear, but if he will not hear thee, then take it um, with thee one or two more, that um, in thee in the, uh, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall uh, may. Let me try it again. The mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. And if they neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Really, Sandy, whichever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whichever uh, ye shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Here in Matthew 16, then eight, Matthew chapter 16, then chapter 18 here, um, Jesus introduced the church to us, and in both times it says there's, there's incredible power in a church. And uh, God gives that uh, authority and power to the church. Uh, he gives... Um, uh, 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 unbelievable authority, and this is almost never used, unfortunately, because the church is given by Jesus great power, and uh, and it's it's institution God set up, and uh, and and in this case, you see that the church discipline basically, where you remove someone from uh, being part of the church, and uh, and there's a process that they go through, and uh, and so we'll talk to you about that. Uh, about just uh, the church membership, what the Bible teaches. Let's look at, let's pray, and then we'll look at some verses. Father, thank you for the chance to teach your word, and I pray that your spirit would be moving in our midst today, and I pray that we would get your thinking. Lord, we're not looking for man's thinking. We're not looking for um, organizations, philosophies, and denominations, ways. We're looking for what your word says, and Lord, you do have something to say on this, and I pray that today um, I'll be able to make that clear to all of us. I would understand your thoughts, and you would speak through me, and we would all see this clearly and know how we should be involved in what you teach in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Just keep in mind what you just read there, that you go to the church, and the church comes, and, and if that person won't hear the church, then you remove him, and now he's a publican and a, and a heathen. Um, he's treated differently because he's removed. Acts 2, in verse 42. And they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. Sorry, I went fast there. Acts 2 and 42. I'm going to read a lot of verses and make quick points, and then I'm going to explain at the end, kind of put it all together for you. So I know we turn in a lot of verses. Acts, look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. This is the first church. Um, uh, and in, 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 there after Pentecost, uh, and in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. And they that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and gave, er, and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house. They ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, just notice the church was together. They had all things come. They shared everything they had. And, and, and then that uh, there at the end it says the Lord added to the church. That's, we'll get back to that. And uh, that is very important. Just some thoughts on church membership. Number one, it is obvious we are part. Uh, we are to be part of a body. We're to be part of a body. And the Bible will break it down a little bit. When I say body, um, we say church body, but literally God illustrates the church as a body with body parts, like uh, eyes and ears. In 1 Corinthians 12, we won't read all that passage. We'll read some there. 
Um, but it says uh, if one part's an eye, one part's an ear, and one part's a hand, and, and, and we're all members, and, and that means body parts in particular. So as a group, you're part of a body, and it says the Lord added the church, and, uh, and uh, they're, we're supposed to be part of a body, and it's all one. Uh, verse 46, they continue daily with one accord, notice the word one here, in the temple, breaking bread, and, uh, and from house to house, and they eat their bread with gladness and singleness of heart. Now I can take it Acts 1, they prayed with one accord. Acts chapter 2, the start of the chapter, they prayed with one accord. It's very important that a, a group becomes one. And if you can't understand that principle, you will be messed up in marriage, you be messed up in church. Okay? Because a family has to realize, uh, Jesus said for this cause, uh, two should become one flesh. Okay? Family is one unit. If you act as individuals without considering the other people, you'll have a messed up family. Okay? Because the, the principle is very important is that God takes multiple and makes them one. And they are to work together as one. Uh, next Sunday, these teams will play. The team, if one team plays not as a team, they will lose the Super Bowl. Okay? If a lineman decides to block who wants to block, or the, the, the wide receiver decides to run the route he wants to run, uh, they're going to lose. Why? Because the team has to become one in order to succeed. So does a family. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems in families is not operating as a unit. They operate as units. And it's, it's a mess. And uh, they need to work together. And uh, the Lord makes a church like that. And they had singleness of heart. They were doing one thing. They were in one direction. And, uh, and, and, and it's obvious this is a part of a body. Um, they, were, they had singleness of heart, we see in verse 46, at the end of the verse. They have a singleness of possessions, verse 44. And these, all, all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and good, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. They had <clears throat> um, they had one, uh, they, had, they had singleness of possessions. Now people have a, a, a problem with this today because uh, people don't like socialism um, and, uh, and, and things like that. But understand, in the church... If somebody had something and somebody else needed something, the church was one, so you had it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, I have food, you need food, you have food. Because you're one. Does that make sense? Um, now, understand the difference, <coughs> the difference <coughs> between that and socialism is uh, every man did it willingly. <laughs> Nobody, if the church came and said, you know what, you got money, this person needs a car, you have a car, I'm taking your car. That would be much different. Okay? Volunteerism, because why? Because you are not giving if somebody takes your stuff and gives it to somebody else. And it changes everything when you can give something to somebody. It's good for you, it's more blessed to give than receive. It's good for them to receive it from somebody. When somebody just, when you take something to somebody else and give it to somebody else, the person who receives it feels entitled, the person who had it, who earned it, feels ripped off. So the voluntary part is vital in understanding that. And they went and sold their lands and, and gave it. And, and, and it, so everybody had what they need. It does not mean you go and take something from somebody. Even in church, you say, that person has a lot of money. It's not fair. I've seen that before. And I said, look, they earned it. Go earn it if you want it. If you have a need, tell us. And, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll help meet the need. But understand, <clears throat> don't despise them because they've earned it. Or because they have something, that they can choose to go sell it and give it to you, but, but, but people have free will. But understand, in the church, <clears throat> the church had a singleness of possession. We're all meeting each other's needs. Okay? And by the way, I want to understand, those of you who receive help, we don't mind that, and we help people, and, and we do that stuff. But understand, get, get in your mind, that get out of that situation so you can flip it. Very important that you don't continually be a receiver. It's bad for you unless you are crippled. I mean, when I mean crippled, I don't mean I'm, I'm, I'm depressed right now. Crippled, I mean no arms, no legs, or, you know, something like that. That's what I mean, crippled. Because it is bad for you to always be a receiver. It's bad for you. But, but understand that, 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 that God's way is singleness of, of heart, singleness of possession, singleness of leadership. Verse 42, and they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And a breaking of bread and their prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. They knew who was in charge. <clears throat> they were following their leadership, and that's the way that the church worked. Then let's go to Acts chapter 4. 
Now, I'm not going to go through those, four, those, those points I just went through about the singleness, but you're going to see it exactly the same here in Acts chapter 4, and you'll just see it. I'll just read it here, and you'll see it's the same thing. Verse 32. <clears throat> and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. That's verse 32, Acts 4, 32. Neither had any of them aught of the things which he possessed of his own, but they had all things common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the uh, piece, uh, price of them which were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and his distributions made to every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who was, uh, who was, uh, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which being by interpretation the sons of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it down at the apostles' feet. Okay, so next week we'll get into this a little bit more about, about things that are done um, by the church, but, but I want you to understand it was the same thing there. Singleness of heart, the apostles led things, everyone did it together, they had one heart, one mind, church working together, it's one, one per, it's one. Okay, you see that, that singleness you'll see in one, and you'll see that uh, very commonly in these things. Um, Acts 5, and verse 32, just to be a little bit monotonous here. <clears throat> um, well, you know what, let me, let me go from, <clears throat> uh, let me go Acts 20. Let me go to Acts 20. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave some things out here. There's a time. I'm not going to get to everything I want to get to. Acts 20. But this one's important. This is multiple pastors being talked to, and it says in verse 28, Acts 20 and 28, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost, Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which hath purchased with his own blood. So you got multiple pastors here. They're overseers, but it said you feed the flock. A flock is singular. Okay? But is, is that one sheep? No. It's a flock of sheep, but the flock is singular. Isn't that interesting how the word for um, multiple sheep is a flock, and it's one, and uh, and a church is one, and so um, you see the oneness there. That's God's plan, and uh, you see this over and over, and that's the, the plan you have for that. And and, and there's there's other things we get to with that, but I want you to get the concept here. Is uh, it is obviously supposed to be part of a body. If you have all individual Christians, you don't have God's design. Okay, you need part of a body. If, if, I, if, if I take any body part off my body and I leave it by itself and it's not connected to a body, it does not do well. Okay? It begins to die. Why? Because the finger needs the heart. The finger needs the brain. Uh, every, everything's connected. And, and there's nerves and there's everything. There's a whole bunch of things that run through every part of your body. And so a Christian is supposed to be part of a body. That's very important. That part of the flock is another thing it's termed as. And that's uh, what you want to do. And by the way, if you just watch, <clears throat> um, uh, I'm an observer, and that's one of the few things I'm very good at. And I'm actually a really good observer. I notice things. I notice the patterns. I, I, I see what the result of things are and, and note that and remember that. And, and uh, it helps me not make the same mistake other people make. I like other people to make mistakes, and I learn the mistake from them. Um, that's what I prefer to do instead of making every mistake myself. And uh, uh, I watch people... And, and, and when, I, when I told you, when I, when I didn't know much about the family, when I, when I was, because I didn't grow up with a good family, and then I wanted to have a good family, I found ten families, and I watched those families to see what they did. And of all ten of those families, the one thing they had common is they were at church every time the doors open, and they were buried in their church. And, 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 and that, that, those were the best families and, uh, that I saw. And they, they were part of the body. And they were, they, were, they were working together the body. My, you know, my ear can do much more if it's part of a body. My ear thinks it wants to be, it wants to be its own man. Uh, you know, my ear's not going to get very far. In fact, it's going to get right there where it falls off my head. And that's all that's the only place it's going. Um, because it can't get anywhere without the rest of a body. And, and you have a need of a body. Okay? Now, we, we understand, we're not teaching today, there is the body of Christ of all believers, and they should be one also. But local church, we see in, in X2, X4, X20, X5, all over, we see uh, over and over this body working together. And you will find that others will meet your needs. Where you are weak, someone else is strong. 
where you are down and depressed or someone who's up and able to encourage you. You will find God meeting your needs. You will find <clears throat> a message to the church. I will preach today a, a, a message and this message and tonight's message. And people will come with every kind of need and every kind of situation. But somehow God makes a message for you. And you think, that pastor preached a message just for me. God, that was just, that was, I must have been the only one because that was just my whole life. You know, about 60 people will say that. Because God somehow tempers the body together. We'll read that. And says, I'm going to speak to each one of you as one. He that hath an ear, let him hear the Spirit, says the church. And so you will hear from God. Hopefully, if, if God, uh, you know, and if mercy shows up today, uh, we will all hear from God, including myself. Why? Because we're one. Bunch of different body parts, bunch of different needs, but God somehow brings it together. Number two, a church is to be organized. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 14, let me go and we'll just stay there. It's farther along in your Bible. 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> a church is to be organized. <clears throat> So I, I'll, I'll knock on doors all the time, witnessing, and I'll talk to some guy. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer and stuff like that, but I just don't believe in organized religion. <clears throat> That's a cute line of today, and it's it's trendy and all that stuff. It's just completely not biblical. First uh, Corinthians fourteen. It's not biblical. <clears throat> and by the way, those people always begin to wither and struggle as Christians. Always begin to wither and struggle, and and they don't. By the way. The worst thing about it is they don't know how messed up they are. <laughs> they don't know how messed up they are. Why? Because they aren't part of a body. And no, nothing is revealed to them. He that hath near can't hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And 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 and, 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 and we just don't we just don't it's just it's continuous, you see it all the time. First Corinthians 14 and verse 40 says, let all things be done decently and in order. Verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the saints. Okay, God has an order. And, and man, we could read a lot of things. I could show you how they organize for the widows to feed them. And I've got, if you want to write references down, you can read Acts 6. You can read 1 Timothy 5, uh, 9 through 10. And just about the organization of different things. But uh, but let me take you to 14 and verse 7. Here, here in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 7. I'll we'll just stay in this chapter. Again, I have too many verses, not enough time. But the concepts are obvious here. <clears throat> Uh, concerning speaking in tongues and, and other gifts, it says, verse 7, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction of the sound, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter in tongue words uh, easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye speak into the air. <clears throat> It's the same thing. Spiritual gifts, you need to have some organization. <coughs> Otherwise, people just talk into the air and nobody knows what to do. Verse 22. There, uh, let me, yeah, let's just do, let's go to verse all the way, maybe a long passage. Where, verse 22. Wherefore, times for a sign, not to them that believe, but them which believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but to them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together unto one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that uh, are unlearned, or unbelievers will not, they say you're mad. But if all prophecy, prophesy, there come one that believeth not, uh, and one unlearned, and he is convinced of all, and, and judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down upon his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, that every one of you has a psalm, hath a doctrine, has a tongue, hath the revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done in an edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be with two, or the most by three, and let that be by course, and that one interpret. Look, and, and so, you see, you're going to speak in tongues, look, let, don't let everybody do it at once. No one's going to understand what's going on. The unsaved will come, and be totally confused, and no one's being edified. Let, some, let it be two or three at the most, two or three people. One person interprets, because you need to know what they said, in Acts chapter 2, they understood what they were saying <clears throat> and, and have an order to that. Let all things be done in edifying. And for, let every man speak by course, one at a time, then let one interpret. Uh, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Uh, and, 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 and go on, and then this the chapter. God is not, verse 33, God is not the other confusion. Verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. So let's, let's illustrate this in a, in a thousand ways. <clears throat> you have a business. Boss says, all right. 
We're going to build widgets. He walks into his office. Uh, how do we build widgets? Who, who's doing what? You don't get anything done if you don't organize things. Okay? We're working right now on, on uh, the boat ministry in the Philippines. and uh, we, we, I have uh, people there in the Philippines. And I, I'm getting them to give me a prize for the boats. And we've got lined up the fishermen to do it. I, last night I went to Spanish church. They wanted to be involved in that. And I went to Spanish church and I said, here's the need. Here's how much you need. I went to children right now raising money in an organized way for uh, buying uh, half of that boat. And the Spanish is raising money to buy half of that boat. It's all organized. If a church has no plan, they don't raise the money for the boat. For the fishermen in the Philippines, and I think it's done. And so it's part of working together. It's part of a one. Uh, families should be like that. Anything without organization um, it usually doesn't go well. Okay? If they get 11 people out in the field for the football game, and then they said, all right, guys, we're going to score a touchdown. What do we do? Just, look, this, if the Lord leads. <laughs> Okay, you're not going to score a touchdown. Okay? <laughs> the Lord might lead the quarterback. Okay, you go run this route, you run this route, you block this guy, you do this. But you have an organization to it, but you don't get anywhere. Uh, Titus 1 5 says this. It says, For this cause I left thy creed that thou mightest set in order the things that are wanting and to ordain elders in every city. Okay? And so we'll, we'll, we'll maybe read that a little bit better. But you set in order the things that are wanting. Number three, people can and should be removed from the fellowship. Back to Matthew. <clears throat> So we have this one fellowship, and the Bible teaches that you should sometimes remove people from that fellowship. Now, here's the kicker here to understand. When you remove from that fellowship, you're in big trouble. You're in big danger. That's biblical. Okay? <clears throat> we go like this verse you read already at Matthew 18 and verse 17. And if you neglect to hear them, go and go tell it unto the church. And if you neglect to hear the church... Let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. That's an unsaved man. It says, look, remove him. And he now, if you don't fellowship with him, he's removed. Okay? Now I'm going to show you this very specifically. It gives you the process in 1 Corinthians 5 also. Way forward there. And again, I'm going to a lot of verses here. But this man is involved in terrible immorality. And, and the whole church knows about it. It's blatant. Even the unsaved people in a wicked city were saying, man, that church is wicked. They got bad stuff going on there, man. That is that is some creepy stuff. And, <clears throat> and nobody's doing anything about it in the church. And in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, well, what are you doing? You need to remove that man. You need to remove that man. He's not repentant and he's flaunting his sin in the church. And it's ruining the testament of Christ. He says, let me tell you what to do. Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my, in my spirit and in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that power. Remember, uh, well, we didn't read it. We didn't read it in Matthew 16. It says, you know, God's given great power to the church. And in, in Matthew 18, it said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Okay? Great authority there. In the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such in one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, <clears throat> You go to the guy and you say, church, this man will stop that first. You go one person. So the biblical order is, and we'll, I don't want to do this too much because we'll get into the next week. But you go to the person, you talk to them. They don't listen, you take someone else in the church. You go to them and talk to them. They don't listen, you bring it up in the church. I'm not talking, you know, then they go to 10 bucks. This is what this is for, okay? Uh, this is for blatant, uh, outright sin, and they're unrepentant and causing problems. Bring it in front of the church. Church says, uh, 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 John down here is uh, is living. There's some John over here, right? Um, and, uh, uh, Herman down here is living in, uh, in in outright sin, and he's doing a bunch of bad things. And uh, and we talked to him. Me, I talked to him first, and me and Fred over here talked to him. And Herman is not repentant of his sin. We need to remove him from this fellowship. One more chance, Herman. The church, uh, we all agree, right? He shouldn't be doing this thing. In this case, he's 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 committing immorality with his stepmom. Uh, Herman is doing this thing. Herman, at church, do we agree this is wicked? He needs to stop this? Yes, amen. Okay, Herman, the church agrees on this. We're going to remove if you don't repent. Will you repent? No? Okay. Church, we're going to vote. Who votes to remove, vote to remove him? I. Okay, who opposed? Okay, Herman. Goodbye. Amen. Nobody talk to Herman. Herman's a heathen to you. Don't have any fellowship with him. We are turning you over to Satan now. You have no church protection. When that happens, 
There's an umbrella of a church that gives you a spiritual protection. He has that no longer. And he's turned over to Satan, and Satan has free attack on him. And Satan's going to beat him to a pulp. You say, you think Satan would make him happy? Satan can't. Satan comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. If he has an opportunity to destroy someone, he always will. He can't help himself. So the protection's removed. We're not praying God protect him. We're, not, we're saying, look, you let Satan mess you up for a while, and maybe you'll get repentance when you realize how wonderful your life is in Christ, in church, with God's people. And he's out. And you're supposed to have no fellowship with him. That's so mean! If you want to call it mean or whatever, it's just biblical. See, people do things and get away with it. The churches allow it, so you have a very messed up church. And the way the Bible phrases it in 1 Corinthians 5 is you have a leavened church. You're supposed to have unleavened worship of God. You put leaven in that bread, and it's all of a sudden changed. It popped up, and you're leaven in the church. And that, that's there in this very chapter. <clears throat> Verse 7, put out therefore the old leaven, that ye may uh, uh, be a new lump, as you, have unle uh, as you are unleavened. And then it talks about keep the feast, verse 8, with, with unleavened bread. Verse 9, I wrote unto you in, in, in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. This guy is. Yet not altogether the fornication of this world, notice that, or with, cup, or with uh, the covetous, or with extortioners, or with idolaters, or with, uh, for with them you must needs go out of the world. So look, I'm not saying don't ever talk to a fornicator. I'm not saying don't ever talk to a, an idolater. You have to go buy from them, right? But... Verse 11, now have I written unto you that, that not to keep company of any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or whaler or drunkard or, or extortioner with one not to eat. What it says. So what does that mean, Pastor? Exactly what it says. But that's mean. It's mean. If you want to call it mean, I don't call it mean. Why? Because you find out this man needs to be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that he may learn not to blaspheme. It's going to bring him back to God. That's the purpose. And then you can go to 2 Corinthians and you find out that he, he says, okay, he's repenting now. Bring him back. He's been beat up by Satan for a while. He's got, he's got a bunch of scars and wounds and he's going to comfort him. He's going to be an overmatch sorrow if you don't go to him. It's a purpose to bring him back to God, not to be mean to him. Because if you are allowed to live in blatant, outright sin, and everything's still good, and you can still be in church, and still be in Sunday school, and still do that, and flaunt your sin around, it's going to ruin the church, and it's going to ruin you. There is consequences. Consequences. Now, understand that, please be careful about this, and and, <clears throat> and go through the, the right process. We will have people in our church who have bad sin problems, but they are struggling against it. Mm -hmm. They are flaunting it, they aren't enjoying it, living in it, making fun of it. They're walking, they walk into church saying, you know what, man, me and my girlfriend. They're not doing that. They're sorrowful, they're weak, and they're being restored. They're being helped. That's not what this is talking about. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and you can have that. But but you can have, but they can, they can be going to a direction. Um, but if, if somebody's an unrepentant, flaunting sin, and, and, <clears throat> and in this weird, <laughs> churches are so concerned with being big. <laughs> They never do this. Now, we've never had to do this. <laughs> because God is good to us when somebody starts wanting to be rebellious and go and go live in sin. They just don't want to be here. And the Holy Spirit convicts them and they, they, they leave. And that's, that's fine. That's an easier way to do it. Um, and and, and, and that, that happens. And, and we don't mind that. I've asked um, I've asked two people not to come back to church. I took someone with me and did it. Um, one was uh, they were a predator. And they were being honest about it. And, uh, and 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 uh, I gotta protect you, and uh, and I just went to them with somebody else and said, "You're gonna stop doing that." I'm not doing that. I said, "I have witnesses. You're doing it. If you lie to me, you're never coming back." And they said, "I'm not doing that." And I said, "Okay." I have four people who said you did, and and I watched you do it also Sunday, just so you know, because I was watching you, and you can't come back. I did that one time. I didn't need to bring it before the church. He said, well, I'm gonna come back anyway. So. And and so and, and he was he was he was a predator. He would have done something very bad. Um, and uh, another person, every time they come to church, they have a fight with somebody. I don't know how they do that. That's very impressive, actually. <laughs> but, but every single time they come to church, they fight with somebody. And I finally uh, went to them and I said, you know, you know, there's a lot of people to fight with in the world. We don't have fight in our church. If you want to fight, go to another church. I'm sure there's another church you'll enjoy. We don't enjoy it. <laughs> and, uh, and the worst thing is, they beg me to come back. 
why do you want to come back? Do, are, do you not find anybody else to fight with? And, uh, and, uh, but uh, a couple of times I've done, I've done something like that. They weren't a member. None of those are members. A different story. And uh, but we don't have to do that stuff. And that's that's in 21 years. And uh, and uh, but you know I'm the shepherd. I got to protect the sheep. And, and sometimes David's got to pull out a sword and whack him upside the head. And uh, and <laughs> and, uh, and people can be removed uh, from fellowship. Next. By the way, I never do that alone. I always talk to someone in the church, some key people, and say, "Let me know what's going. Let me know what's going on here, and we got to do something about this." And, and I, I don't do things by myself. Um, we do it as a team, and uh, things. Next, <clears throat> you say, "I don't want to go to church where I'm going to have that kind of accountability." Okay, lots of churches out there for you. <laughs> if you don't want any accountability, we're, we're probably not the church. We know what's going on. We, we pay attention. Why? Because we want to lift you up. We want to lift you up. And we don't want you to drag anybody else down. And we want God's presence here. And so we, we, we know. We care. And, uh, and we do that. And, uh, and try to do that because we love people. Because we want uh, people to do well. Uh, next. They sometimes made decisions together. Acts chapter 6. Just briefly. I like I spent a lot of time on this. Um, <clears throat> um, most of the time. And I, just, I, I was going to do all this. And, and get all the verses. But. Um, because of the time, it's not really what we're, we're doing this week. Maybe a little next week. Um, most of the time, the, the leader just makes <coughs> the decisions, and that's much more easy, makes much less contention, and much less tedious. Uh, basically, um, the, the, the apostles made all, most all the decisions, but occasionally the church would make a decision. I think that's a healthy way to do things in most things. I think that leadership should make most decisions. Um, and I think, whether it's the, the husband, whether it's um, the business owner, but I think all, there are occasions when everybody should decide together in certain circumstances. And this is where the Bible was run, the church in the New Testament. Acts 6, verse 3. Wherefore, this is choosing deacons, look out among you seven men of honest, uh, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, of wisdom. You may appoint them over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so they, they, found, uh, they found deacons and, and such like that. And uh, this, we, we saw when they removed people from the church, they did it corporately. Um, in First Corinthians uh, chapter 5, we read it earlier. And, uh, and so sometimes they decided things together. Um, <clears throat> they sent people out together. Let me go to one more verse. Acts 15. The church uh, agreed on some doctrine and sent people out with a letter with that doctrine. In verse 22, then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barnabas and Silas. So uh, now that the, the apostles had decided the doctrine and things, um, and we could go to First Corinthians 13, or I mean, uh, we can go to Acts 13, where, where the, the leaders were told, uh, call these guys, uh, Paul, Paul and Barnabas, and send them into the ministry. So most of the time, it's the leaders that make the choices, but occasionally the, the, the group, it, again, we're shown as part of a group, they make a decision together. <clears throat> and, uh, and if you want to see where it shows that uh, most of the decisions are made by them, 1 Peter 5, 2, um, look at the word charge um, in First and Second Timothy and Titus, set in order um, is a command of Titus 1, 5, and others, things like that. Now, <clears throat> the biggest thing I want to say is, is, for, is uh is this, and this is why I've been rushing a little bit because of time. There is a mystical bond that God does. Okay? And this is where I feel like whenever I talk to pastors and other people on this and I read things on, on church membership, most people don't get the most important point of the thing. This becoming one is actually something that God does. It's not part of an organization of man. Now let me go to, remember, let's go to Let's go to First Corinthians. And uh, remember in Acts 2 it says, The Lord added unto the church daily, such as should be saved. The Lord added the church. <clears throat> the Lord added the church. And uh, God does this thing. God does this thing. And it's, it's really important that we get this. First Corinthians 12. And this is where I think you need to understand if you want to really understand kind of how Open Door does things. And uh, as far as church membership, because I always feel like I don't have time to explain this to people. And, uh, and, and so I'm glad to get to explain this, although now I'm about out of time. 
And uh, <laughs> so the church usually has a thing, I want to join the church. Okay, we vote you in the church. I want you to understand this. God has usually already done that. Okay? Because I believe God puts someone in the church and makes them and molds them as a part of that body. It's not a, a, a business transaction. Amen. It's a spiritual transaction that only God can do. God says, I need this person in this church. I'm going to put them in that church. Okay? It, it, pastors will listen to this message online because they will because they love to find out controversial stuff about church membership. Okay? <laughs> pastors. I mean, you're listening to your camera from looking at it. And uh, so, get this. This is God's word. You don't need to be stressed out about trying to get everybody to stay in your church. It's God's work. God builds the church. God builds the church. And so many pastors don't like the ministry because they're so worried about everybody. Who's going to leave? Who's going to come? And how do I get these people? And this person can add so much to my church. If they're needed in your church, God will put them in your church. If they shouldn't be there and God removes them, then be glad. You have gangrene. And if God removes gangrene, you don't want to be part of it. It's God's work. That's why I'm not saying, I'm going to leave the church. All right. Maybe I'm stressed. It's an amazing thing. People come and almost think they got you held hostage. It's almost humorous to watch their disappointment. <laughs> Let you preach like that again. I'm never coming back. Okay. <laughs> First of all, great peace of they which love that law, nothing shall offend them. That's right. Psalm 119, 165. First of all, just start there. <laughs> but okay. You know, if you have that spirit, you're probably, you're probably, you're probably spiritual enough for anyone, for us anyway. We'll, we'll survive, trust me. And, 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 and we'll be okay. We love people, but, you know, if they got an attitude, we're, we're not trying to build a biggest church anymore. <coughs> Please, God, let him build the church. However he wants to build, it's his deal. He's good at building things. First Corinthians 12. And let's read this verse 11. Let's watch how God does this. Verse 11. And, and it's so obvious. But all but all these worketh that one and all self same spirit, divided to every man severally as his will. The Holy Spirit is going to be doing everything. Capital S in the spirit there. For as a body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink of this into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say to the hand, because I am not of the hand, I am, I am, I am not of the body, is it not of the body? No, of course it is. Um, go down to verse uh, 18, we'll look at this verse. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body. As has pleased him. Pretty clear, huh? Verse 24 says, For our comely parts have no need, uh, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Uh, that there should be no schism in the body, no gap. Um, and that uh, the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one mem member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And whether a member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles and so forth. God set in the church. It's so obvious here. So, someone comes to me, and what usually happens, God brings some in the church, <clears throat> and they fit in, and God's using them, and, and they're a blessing, and they're getting blessed, and everything's good. It's a, it's a great team. And then, and then eventually they come and say, Pastor, you know what? I want to join the church. They're already part of the church. <clears throat> in my mind understand this, for us to vote for them to say who votes for so-and-so to be part of the church, that I believe God already did it, but I do think there's a reason we do that. Okay, there's a reason we do that. But I want to say, it's a work of God. We could vote for somebody and somebody can say they'll be part of the church, but they're not really a member of the body. Right. Even though we went through that process with them, because God didn't put them there, and God has not tempered them together. God has not molded them together. Like I'm holding a finger. It's not part of my body, and I'm holding this finger. Well, it says I want to join your body. Well, like, you know what? You're not really, I, got, I got my fingers here. And, and it's not, 
there's, so it's a work that God has to do, and God brings him in. So I believe it's done supernaturally by God's Spirit, and God puts a body together. We do the formality of that because we have a church constitution, <clears throat> but there is a reason we do that. Joining is a business formality of what God has already done, I believe. And sometimes somebody could mean, somebody remember, and I'll say, are you sure about that? Why do I even remember? Not because I don't like them or don't love them, maybe they will become a member someday, but because it just doesn't seem like they're tempered together with us. And that, that, that doesn't mean they won't, and that doesn't mean that someday won't happen. But, and I won't say no to them. Um, I'll just say, you know what, let me pray about this for a while. And some people will say, yeah, but let's do it. Some people will just say, okay, let's do that. Because I think God has to do that. God has to do that. I've often said, and, 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 and again, I wish I had better answers, and some people say, how do you get all these people from other countries, and they all feel like this is their church? Why don't they want to go with their own culture, their own food, their own language? And, and, they, and, and we give people, they come here, and they hardly speak a lick of English. We'll have, during this service this morning, we'll have, we'll have five, six people in here who don't speak almost any English. And they come to church here. How, how did that happen? And they love it, and they're blessed, and they leave refreshed, and God speaks to them. And, and why? Why are they here? Why do they love that? They've got a church on the road who speaks their language, who's recruiting them. But this is their church. Did God put them here? That's it? That's all. I don't, I don't, that's the only answer you have is God put them here. <clears throat> and and, and, and God, God does that. <clears throat> I do believe, however, it's good for someone to make a commitment to become a member of the church. Because that's good for them. Let me illustrate this in something that seems unrelated. I had a lady come and she says, uh, my fiancé loves me, da 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 and, and, and she told me the whole story about this guy, and I, in my mind I'm going, you have no idea what you're talking about, this guy does not love you, he's using you. I said, where's your ring? He says, he's going to give me one someday. I said, he does not love you, he's using you. And she says, no, no, you don't know him, da 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 He's this, and he's this, and he's this. So you said he owns three businesses, right? Oh, yeah. So why did they buy you a ring? He would. If I asked him, I said, okay, do me a favor. You ask him to buy your ring, and then go to the store with him and pick an expensive one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, I'll do that, and you watch. You'll buy it for me. I said, okay. She came back the next week. She wasn't engaged anymore. Is a ring that important? No. But the commitment was. The money was. It revealed something. It revealed something. Yeah, he would have bought her a, a $10 ring. <laughs> but that's why you get a ring in a date. And so, <clears throat> I think, open door is committed to people. And we commit to you. And we're there for you. And we'll be there for you. But we're in a society, and here's the problem, we're in a society that wants benefits without responsibilities. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Okay? And so what people want is they want to come to church, get what they need, and not have any commitment to the church. I don't give the church. I don't want to be there on the services. I just want to come there and need something. I just want to get and get, and I'll go away, and I'll get that. <clears throat> so members of Open Door get certain privileges. <laughs> For example, this building, if you are a member of this church and you need this building, um, <clears throat> For a wedding, for a, a, a birthday party, or whatever, you, you get the building for free. Okay? If you are, <clears throat> as long as everything, to me, use this building has to agree with our doctrinal statement. You can't use it for a drunken party or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, <clears throat> but, however, if you're not a member, you don't get that privilege. Because there's, there's, there's a, when you get a commitment, I get my wife because I married her. I made a commitment. And so members, they say, <clears throat> you know what? God put me here. I'm joining. I need a member. That formality, I think, does something for you to understand you have now a commitment. Because we will give ourselves to you all day long, whether you're a member or not. We'll do that for the, the, the heroin addict out the street out here. We'll, we'll give ourselves to you all the time. But a, a, a good relationship, but I don't, I don't have those relationships in my regular life everyday life. The, I have good relationships in my regular everyday life. I don't live in one-way relationships. I go out and serve people and love people. You understand that you're in an unhealthy relationship as all you, if all you do is give. Get that. Very important. If you have a bunch of people around you who always take, you're not in a healthy relationship. Relationships are two ways. 
So we will go serve people in ministry in a one-way relationship. That's fine. But in your family, in your best friends, you have two relationships, or you will be in an unhealthy, abusive relationship. And in church, when you say, I'm a member, and I'm a part of that, we say, okay, here's your responsibilities. I don't want a responsibility. Okay, then, then don't become a member, because I want you to understand. Just like when I tell them, you, you want to get married? Okay, here's your responsibilities. No, 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 I don't want all that. I just want to have fun, and you know. Okay. It's, a, it's a commitment. Right. Till death do you part. Better for worse, sickness and health. And so I think that it's healthy to have a church membership. God already does it, but I think it's healthy for you to say, this is my church. I'm a member. I will be there for my church. And, and do that. So in our, in our church constitution here, <clears throat> and we have what's called a covenant in our church constitution, I'm going to read you the covenant. because there's, And we have, a, we have a whole thing, membership, and the responsibilities of membership, and I'm not going to bore you to death, um, Article 4, membership, and, and the responsibilities of that. But just a covenant kind of tells you, this is the covenant we're making together as a group. And I'm going to finish up with this. Having been led, as we believe, by the Holy Spirit to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into a covenant with one uh, another as one body. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, strive together in unity for the furtherance of God's kingdom through, the, through this church, to promote its prosperity and spirituality through continual prayer, service, giving, and teaching of its biblical principles, ordinances, and doctrines. We will also personally strive to live for God in biblical holiness to overcome sin in all worldliness, to keep a strong personal devotion and prayer life for the glory of God and the furtherance of his kingdom, and to seek salvation of our kindred, acquaintances, and all others who walk circumspect in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and to avoid all evil speech, gossip, and backbiting, and excessive anger to abstain from drunkenness and illicit drugs and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over each other in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, and to aid each other in sickness and distress, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rule of our Savior to secure it reconciliation without delay. We will over engage and we will remove, when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this uh, covenant and the principles of God's word. <clears throat> so some people take this way too far, and they take it where, um, you know, you, you now live in Cambodia as a missionary, and you're so tied into your home church because you remember that church, or, or you're, <clears throat> you know, you moved to Mississippi, and, and I'm a member of Open Door Baptist, and in there, look, if you're living in Mississippi, and, living, and you're going to be there, go join a church there and be involved in there. Because find one that God molds you into. Okay? There's nothing mystical about church membership except for what God does. In man's side, the business part of it is the commitment to say, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. But God puts you in a church. And when God puts you in a church, you don't choose to leave. If God puts you there, God must make you leave. It's not because it's not fun or the pastor's not nice or because the, the, the air conditioning's not working or anything like that. Okay? <clears throat> If God has molded you and said, this is my church, then you stick with that thing until God drags you out clawing. And God puts you in. It is that thing that God puts you in. And puts you in. Now, transfusions can work, but they're very difficult. Body parts do not go very well from body to body to body. And to switch churches should be done wisdom and counsel and carefulness, because God tempered you into a body. And it's a very it's a very sacred thing that God did. And, and, and you should also be there. Why? Because if the if you are a member and you're not there, the body's missing a body part. And you gotta be there. You got you gotta be committed and, 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 and realize that you're part of a body and a body works together. And and so it's all very important. So that's that's the simple teaching of, of church membership. We use the word in the English a little bit different. Um God says you are members in particular. We say that's yep, church membership role. No, member is body part. You're tempered part of a body that God puts you into. And so that's the good responsibility. And that's what God does. God does that. And that's why you follow the, the, the most important thing that I found when I became a pastor and started talking to people about coming to church, stuff like that. The number one word they look for is comfortable. Not God's will, 
not where God put me, not being used by God, not where the Holy Spirit speaks to me. Comfortable. Comfortable is not what you're looking for. You're looking for a place where God puts you and molds you as part of a body where you can be used by God because this whole body is working together right now. My knees are holding me up and my hands are working and my vocal cords are working and my heart is beating. This whole body is working together for one cause and you need to be part of a body working together for one cause because as an ear or a finger or an eye, you by yourself will be ineffective. <clears throat> and so, and then also, this goes further, and I don't have time to teach on this, but churches working together becomes a bigger body. But that's... That doesn't happen very often. But uh, we try to do that. Okay, let's pray. we got to go. Oh, thank you for a chance to teach your word. Maybe we've got this doctrine, this teaching, Lord. And maybe we become body parts and uh, mold together and bring the people that should be there. And Lord, help us to live in, in such a way that, that the body is edified and we, we edify one another in love, as you said here in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Thank you. You put the body together and we give you the glory. And we just pray that open door be the body you want it to be, functioning as one to do great things for you. In Jesus' name, amen.